Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. I thought that it might be good to do something very simple and basic tonight to kind of ground some of all the other things that are coming and going through Monday night class. Back to basics. When one comes to meditate or comes to enter a spiritual life, um, what's asked in a certain way, quite simply, is a, a spirit of sensitivity that the quality of mindfulness or awareness that we train in meditation is really one of listening, paying attention um, with the heart. Poem from Mary Oliver. Some questions you might ask. Is the soul solid like iron? Or is it tender and breakable like the wings of a moth in the beak of an owl. Who has it and who doesn't? I keep looking around me. The face of the moose is as sad as the face of Jesus. And the swan opens her white wings slowly. And in the fall, the black bear carries leaves into the darkness to sleep. One question leads to another. The soul, does it have a shape? Like an iceberg? Like the eye of a hummingbird? Does it have one lung? Like the snake and the scallop? Why should I have it? And not the anteater who loves her children? Why should I have it and not the camel? Come to think of it, What about the maple trees? What about the blue iris? What about all the little stones sitting alone in the moonlight? What about roses and lemons with their shining leaves? What about grass? So there comes a kind of sensitivity or listening to some mystery that we're born into. And in that way, spiritual practice is not about a whole set of beliefs. But what we can know, hearing the cry of the raven or the crow, sitting with ourselves in meditation, There's a story I've told on and off over the years. Some of you may have heard. Some of you who've come regularly may have heard a number of these stories tonight, so (laughs) what can you do? I I plead for a beginner's mind. (laughs) But I remember also listening to the stories that they would tell in different monasteries where I lived. And I just loved the stories. And it didn't matter if I'd heard them before. They were, oh, yeah, that story again. (laughs) So a woman who I knew well in Amherst came to see me uh, sometime after her husband died. And uh, they'd been very much involved in all the spiritual life of that community there in Massachusetts. Um, He was a physician. And after he died, so many people came to the house and brought food and love and care. And some weeks later, um, she ran into a dear friend who was a Tibetan Buddhist. They'd been in the Buddhist community. And he got very excited and he said, you know, I've been doing meditation for your husband every day, the 49 days of the Tibetan Book of the Dead and prayers and meditations, and I have really a deep sense I've seen him somehow, the spirit, and he's just entering the, you know, the 
realm of the Buddha in the West, or the green Buddha of this uh, Amitabha or Moga City, whatever, a certain color of light, and this whole vision. And she was very reassured, he's fine, you know. But a couple of days later, she ran into a, another dear friend of theirs who was part of a Christian spiritual community, contemplative community. And this friend came up and was equally excited and said, you know, he's great. I mean, I've been doing my prayers and meditations and he's there with the ascended masters and I can see him and this white light and this whole vision. And that was rather confusing to her. So she decided to call one of her main teachers, who was a Sufi master who lived in Washington, and she rang him up on the phone. And before she could lay out the problem, he said, oh, I'm so glad you called. I've been thinking so much about you and your husband. And, you know, he's already taken incarnation. He's just, you know, as a seed embryo in the womb of a woman, and he was giving this whole story. And it made it really tough for her. So she came to see me. (laughs) And I listened to it all. And after I listened, I said, you know, there are so many stories that we may have about this mystery of life that we place on top of it, that it's terribly confusing. I said, and if you put the stories aside of what happens to him when he dies or to you when you die, because that is also confusing to you, and if instead you sit still and you listen inside to what you know most deeply in yourself, independent of all the rest of that, what would that be? What is it that you know? These are, in a way, very confusing times. The war that's happening is confusing, painful. Um, The violence in the society, uh, things seem to be developing on one hand, and yet on the other hand, they also seem to be developing more greed and hatred and delusion on the other hand. And even in the spiritual realm, you go into a good Western bookstore, a spiritual bookstore, and there's the wisdom of the ages, you know, the alchemical texts are on this wall, and the ancient Egyptian things are there, and over there is, you know, um, the Taoist section, and it's kind of remarkable that we have available at least the writings of all these wisdom traditions. And it's not just the traditions, but there's the drums and the tapes, the shamans and the chakra systems and the Enneagram and the tales of the Hasidism, you know, and the Buddhist, the Tibetan and the Zen and the Vipassana and the Pure Land and the Dzogchen and Advaita and what to believe. It really, it's confusing. A fool went to the rabbi and said, I know I'm a fool, Rabbi, but I don't know what to do about it. (laughs) Please advise me what to do. Oh, my son, exclaimed the rabbi in a complimentary way, if you know you're a fool, then surely you're not completely a fool. (laughs) Then why does everyone say I'm a fool, complained the man. The rabbi regarded him thoughtfully a moment. If you yourself don't understand that you're a fool, he chided him, but only listen to what people say, then surely you are a fool indeed. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to know what to believe, isn't it? I have this little button that my, I was out shopping for CDs with my teenage daughter at the record store. She said, here's a button for you, Dad. And it says on it, I reincarnated for this. <laughs> So I would ask you, I mean, here's Sultri Malioni coming one week and Ajahn Jamin in a couple of weeks and Ajahn Sumedho some weeks before and another Tibetan Lama later in June who's going to visit us and so forth. Um, As I asked this woman, what is it that we actually know, that we really know ourselves, so that even if the Buddha or Jesus or the Dalai Lama or your own mother said no, um, 
you would say, this is what's true. I know this to be true in my own experience. And usually it's only a few things, very basic things. You might reflect on it. I've asked at different times as I've talked about this subject, what do you really know? Somebody's hand will go up. That things change. Mm -hmm. That I know, that things keep changing. Thoughts, feelings, the sensations of the body, the seasons, everything changes. Mm -hmm. One person raised their hand except for my stupidity, but we'll leave that aside. (laughs) Things change. Somebody else raised their hand. That whatever I believe, I know that there's other opinions about it. That's a pretty good fact, isn't it? Have you observed that? (laughs) Somebody else raised their hand. That this world, as we experience it, has pleasure and pain and light and dark and sweet and sour and gain and loss and up and down. Anybody not have that? Just basics. So we begin to observe the way things are more than all the stories about them. Now I read you a story, which I read actually in, I think, January, but I felt like reading it again tonight. So, about a century or two ago, the Pope decided that all the Jews had to leave Rome. He decided this periodically over the millennia. Um, And naturally there was a big uproar from the Jewish community. So the Pope made a deal because they came and complained a great deal. We've got to do something about this. All right, he would sit and have a debate with a member of the Jewish community to decide if they should leave. And if the master that they chose was wiser, the Jews could stay. But if the Pope understood more deeply, then they would have to leave. So the story tells. The Jews, having no choice, picked for their representative a man named Moshe. And he went to the Pope and he said, before we have this debate, I have one condition about the way that I teach. I don't teach with words. It is my custom to do it all without words. Can you do that? So the Pope agreed. And the day of the debate came, and Moshe and the Pope sat opposite each other for a full minute, everyone around watching. And then the Pope raised his hand and showed three fingers. Moshe looked back at him and raised one finger. The Pope waved his fingers in a circle around his head. Moshe pointed to the ground where he sat. The Pope pulled out a wafer and a glass of wine. Moshe pulled out an apple. The Pope stood up and said, I give up. This man is too wise. The Jews can stay. An hour later, the cardinals all sat around the Pope asking what happened. The Pope said, well, first I held up three fingers to represent the Trinity, but he responded by holding up one finger to remind me that there was still one God common to all the religions of the world. Then I waved my finger around me to show him that God was all around us. He responded by pointing to the ground and showing that God was also right here with us where we sat. I pulled out the wine and wafer to show that God absolves us from our sins but he pulled out an apple to remind me that there was still original sin. He had an answer for everything. What could I do? (laughs) Meanwhile, the Jewish community crowded around Moshe. (laughs) So what happened, they asked. Well, said Moshe, first he said to me that the Jews had three days to get out of here. (laughs) I told them that not one of us was leaving. Then he told me this whole city would be cleared of Jews. I let him know we were staying right here. (laughs) Yes, yes, and then, asked the crowd. I don't know, said Moshe. He took out his lunch and I took out mine. So, the few things we know. 
whatever I believe, there's some other story about it, right? <laughs> and that things change, and that life is pleasure and pain and joy and sorrow and up and down and gain and loss. And how do we know them? We know them, the suchness of things, the truth of things, by a simple and direct experience, a direct observation, by our awareness itself, and by trusting this repeated direct experience. Once a great man sat under the tree of enlightenment, wrote Zen Master Sansanim, saw the morning star and became awakened. He absolutely believed his eyes, his ears, his nose, his tongue, his body, his mind. The sky is blue, the earth is brown. Things are as they are. And when he saw things clearly, he became enlightened. I would suggest that knowing just these few things may be enough. Certainly will save a lot of study on your part. To know them and live by the things that we know is to rest in what my teacher Ajahn Chah called the one who knows inside, to discover that place that knows in us, the trusting heart that has found what is so in every moment. Things change. They can't be grasped. In every moment, there is light and dark and up and down, gain and loss. Whatever view we have, it's but a fleeting opinion. There'll be another. To rest in the one who knows, to find that trust in our direct experience. Once upon a time, a young girl who lived near the edge of a forest and loved to wander there became lost. It grew dark, and the little girl didn't return home, and her parents became very worried. They began calling for the little girl, searching all over, grew darker. They called the neighbors, got everyone to help. Meanwhile, the girl wandered about in the forest, became anxious and worried because it was dark and couldn't find her way home, tried one path and another and became tired and finally came to a clearing and lay down by a big rock and fell asleep. Her parents were frantic. They scoured the forest. The neighbors called and called the girl's name, no avail. Some of the searchers left and the parents became discouraged, but they searched throughout the whole night and the next day. And sometime in that afternoon, the father came to the clearing where the girl had lay down to sleep. And he saw his little girl, and he ran toward her yelling and making a great noise, which, which awoke her because she had fallen asleep again. And the girl saw her father, and with a great shout of joy, she exclaimed, Daddy, I found you. The one who knows has found what it is like to live in the reality of the present. And it's very, very simple. I was teaching some years ago with Brother David Stendelrost, who is a wonderful teacher and friend. And during this Buddhist Christian dialogue, or whatever it was called, he asked this whole crowd of people, he said, by what authority is it that Jesus teaches what he does? Interesting question. You know, is it by the authority of his Father in heaven or by the authority of the years of, you know, of being a rabbi and all the training or whatever? People had all their imaginations and their stories about it. And he said, if you read by what authority Jesus speaks of the world, the most common phrase he uses is, Who among us does not know? And then he uses an image of the lilies of the field, you know, or the mustard seed, or the parable of yeast, or who among us will cast the first stone who has not sinned. And the authority by which Jesus teaches is that authority of wisdom or understanding that is there inherently in everyone to whom he speaks. In the Buddha's teaching, it's very much the same in its essence. There are only a few basics that get repeated over and over. The teaching of impermanence. 
that if we understand this and put our lives in harmony with the truth of change, we find freedom. And that if we try to grasp what changes inevitably, we will suffer. So he teaches the Four Noble Truths that there is suffering in life and that the cause of the unnecessary suffering of human beings is grasping and that there is a freedom, a joy, a release when we let go. Really simple. If there's grasping, there's suffering. My teacher Ajahn Chah used to wander around and ask people, are you suffering? (coughs) And if you said no, he'd say, great, you know, have a good day. (laughs) And if you said yes, he'd look, he said, oh, must be grasping today, you know. (laughs) And then he'd wander off. It's that simple. As my good friend Lou Richmond, who wrote a fine book on work uh, and um, kind of right livelihood in a spiritual way recently, he said, you are the CEO of your inner life, right? (laughs) There are things that we have minimal control over, and that's particularly other people, in case you haven't (laughs) noticed, and the changing events of the world although one can certainly contribute either to injustice or, you know, racism or the terrible things of society, or you contribute to good things. But we don't have a lot of control over it. And then there's something where we have a great deal to tend to, and that is the state of our own heart and our mind. And so this is what the Buddhas was teaching, to distinguish what there is that we have minimal control over And that's impermanent and can't be grasped. And the more you try and make somebody different, the more you'll suffer. It's very simple. And then the things that we can tend to, which is the radical reality that it's our own consciousness in our heart as we move through this world that creates the kind of life of suffering or freedom that's there for us. And just these simple Direct, experienceable truths are what lead to freedom. They go to the very deepest level of spiritual teaching. If we look at this identity of body and mind, it's called the skandhas of feelings and thoughts and perceptions that make up this life. The more we possess and grasp, try to, ourselves, our children, the people around us, what happens? The more conflict comes. But the more we tend to it with care and respect, knowing that it changes. I don't want it to grow old. Try that. See how it works. The more we relate from love rather than possession, not claiming things for oneself, but seeing them as they are, the more at ease our heart is, the wiser we are. So that when Bahia went to the Buddha for teachings one day and said, give me the gist of the Dharma, just the essence of it, because we're here in the middle of the road and we don't know how much time we have, just give me the essence. And the Buddha said, Bahia, it is this simple. In what is seen, there should be just what is seen. And in what is heard, just what is heard. And what is sensed, just what is sensed. And what is thought, just what is thought. This is how you must train yourself. And when you see in this way, there will be no what should be or what might be. There will be things as they are. And in this place, which is neither here or beyond or midway between, you will find the freedom of the heart. Just being with things as they are brings freedom. To love and not to possess, not to grasp, struggle. Well, you might say, that's fine, but what about rebirth? What about the different realms of existence? What about karma? What about the Abhidhamma and Buddhist psychology? What about the Eightfold Path and the Seven Factors of Enlightenment and the Ten Paramitas and all these other Buddhist teachings and the Ten Bhumis and the, you know, Bodhisattva Vows and could go on and on. 
I mean, isn't there a place for all that stuff? One day, a man came up to see the Buddha. And all these stories are really, the teachings of the Buddha are primarily told through stories. And said, I understand that you are an awakened one. And the Buddha said, yes, that's my name. <laughs> and he said, great, if you're a Buddha, I have some questions for you. He said, go ahead. He said, since you're a Buddha, I want to know what happens when you die. And the Buddha asked him, why is it that you want to know? And the man said, because if I know what happens when I die, then I'll know how I should live my life. The Buddha asked him further, because the Buddha very often didn't answer people's questions. He got them to look and find the one who knows in themselves. He said, let me ask you some questions. He said, suppose I were to tell you that there are many lives which was the tradition in India, and that one life led to another, so forth. If I gave you that answer, then how would you want to live? And the man reflected about it, and he said, well, I would want to be kind to other people because it would feel good in this life, but also it would sow the seeds of people's kindness toward me in future lives. And I'd want to be generous because, again, there's a great joy in that generosity, and it would sow the seeds of abundance in the future lives. And I would ha want to speak and act with integrity, because that virtue now would make my life clear and happy, and it would be the seeds for awakening in the future. And the Buddha said, just so, my friend. Now suppose I were to tell you that there is only one life, that this is the show, this is it. How then would you live? <coughs> The man sat and reflected, and he said, hmm, I'd want to be very generous because you can't take it with you, so you might as well enjoy the generosity of giving it away now. And I would certainly want to be compassionate because I wouldn't see people again, loving, each time. And I'd want to have integrity and virtue because this is all I have, is my own dignity and worth in this life. And he answered in the same way. And the Buddha said, just so, my friend, and wouldn't reply about how, what happens when you die. Mm -hmm. That simple. All the teachings are directed back to living in the reality of the present and discovering what the Buddha called the sure heart's release, the possibility that even in conflict, even in illness, even in all the turns that life brings to us, that we can be free, that our hearts can be filled with compassion, that we can find ease and peace and compassion and bring it into the world. My friend Ajahn Sumedho, who was here for those who came the last month, an American abbot and teacher from a monastery in England, says, that he understands all of this as simply the practice of letting go. The practice of letting go is very effective for minds obsessed by compulsive thinking about spiritual matters or otherwise. <laughs> you simplify your meditation down to sim just two words, let go, rather than trying to develop this practice and then develop that and achieve this and go into that and understand this and read the sutras and study Abhidharma and learn Sanskrit and Pali and Madhyamaka and Prajnaparamita and get ordinations in Hinayana, Mahayana and Vajrayana and write books and become a world-renowned authority on Buddhism. Instead of becoming the world's expert on Buddhism and being invited to great international Buddhist conferences, just let go, let go. I did nothing but this in my practice for years. Every time I tried to figure things out, make them a certain way, I'd say, let go, let go, until that desire would fade away. So I'm making it very simple for you to save you from getting caught in incredible amounts of suffering. There's nothing more sorrowful than having to attend international Buddhist conferences. <laughs> Some of you might have the desire to become the Buddha of the age, Maitreya, radiating love throughout the world, but instead I suggest just being an earthworm, 
letting go of the desire to radiate love throughout the world. Just be an earthworm who knows only two words, let go, let go, let go. You see, ours is called the lesser vehicle, the Hinayana, so we have only these simple poverty-stricken practices. (laughs) The key is so simple. It's to open our eyes and our heart with this quality of mindfulness. And mindfulness is a presence that doesn't judge. It has kindness to it and sensitivity, and it sees the way things are, the sorrows and the beauty that are there in every being, that are there right in front of us. And the laws of life, how it changes, how it gives birth to new form in a moment and vanishes. I remember going to be with a woman who sat here for many years as she was dying of cancer sitting with her and her children, and what an honor it was to be with a person dying consciously. And because of the kind of cancer she had, she was quite conscious till near the end, but she'd become thin and very yellow. Her skin had turned quite yellow, kind of toxemia. And she was dying in the fall, and she had her bed put in the living room by this great big picture window, and outside the window was this wonderful big tree, And as the tree started to turn from green to kind of various colors, and then the leaves got very yellow, she and the tree were going through the same process. And just as the last week as she was getting ready to die, it had dropped almost all its leaves, and the ones that were left were just the color of her face. It was like she and the tree were doing what we do, which is to take birth, to have a certain experience, and then to release that. Now, when Aldous Huxley was dying, as many people know, because it's a famous story, someone asked him in his ear, you know, whispered, all the spiritual adventures and things that you've passed in your life, what is the secret of life? What have you learned from all this? He said, I'm almost embarrassed to say that it comes down quite simply to being kinder. That was his simple answer. If you took that as your religious practice, the Dalai Lama takes it as his, it would get you a pretty long way. To see with the heart, without rejecting, to stop cherishing opinions, as the third Zen patriarch says, and to see with the heart. Sylvia Borstein, who teaches here, told me a story of a man she knew, she and her husband both knew well, who was a famous psychiatrist and had become the president of the American Psychiatric Association and a a very great writer and thinker, um, who was also known to be a gentleman, a very kind and kind of gracious temperament. And in the last years of his life, he became senile. He got Alzheimer's. So he didn't know where he was sometimes or what was what or who was who. And they were invited to go over to dinner to his house by his wife, who was also a good friend one day. And so they showed up to the door, bottle of wine in hand. You know it's California after all time for dinner. (laughs) Rang the doorbell and he opened the door and he looked at them for a while. It was clear he had no idea who they were, even though they'd been very close friends. Kind of looked at them a little bit blankly. And then he said, I don't know who you are, but whoever you are, please come in and enjoy my home. And they said, even though his memory was gone, the spirit of his heart still remained. If we are to transform ourselves, it is on this level that the transformation takes place. What is it in our meditation practice or in our life that is unacceptable, that comes and knocks on the door and says, here I am, and you say no and you shut the door. You don't say, I welcome you into my home. I don't want to see that. I don't want to deal with this, with the grief that we carry from the past or the unfinished business or the pain in our bodies. 
can we sit and open to it? Can we practice in our meditation that art that will get us through life wisely of seeing what is so? Doesn't mean you have to follow it or do what it tells you. That would be a real mistake. But to bow to it and say, yes, this is true when it's true. Things are the way they are. Because this is the place of freedom for us. It's such a simple invitation. The heart can be free. And it can be free in any circumstance. And we know that. Something in us knows it. We forget it. But it's deep in the one who knows. And this freedom and non-grasping has nothing to do with indifference or not caring about life. But rather it's an open-hearted presence with all that's there. It's an opening of the body, the feelings and heart and the mind, with compassion to experience what's present, the truth as it is. Just completed this last week a men's retreat in the new residential retreat center, and it was a it was a delicious retreat. It was, you know, beautiful spring weather. And just a great thing to sit in the circle of 75 men in company with all these men. They were all nervous on the first day because men are afraid of one another. We have been taught to, you know. Um, And so we had them go out and do silent walking meditation in pairs, just shoulder to shoulder with people they didn't know for 45 minutes. And at first, it was like nervous, and who's this guy, and am I safe, and so forth. And by the end of 45 minutes, they came in and they were smiling like they were brothers. You know, Because in other places, there were men from other parts of the world, Palestinian and uh, Iranian, people from Latin America, and so forth. They said, you know, we put our arms around each other. We hold hands. We love our brothers. Here in America, we're afraid of each other. It was very beautiful to watch this process grow over the week. And then we had counsel, and the men would sit together and speak of their struggles, basically, because they didn't. nobody told them how to be a man, except on TV and things like that. John Wayne, you know how it goes. And they knew something wasn't right with that, or in the army. But um, it was like one man who sat there, in the circle and listen to men telling of their struggles and their hopes. And we had a night where people just talked about their sons and their fathers, very moving. And he began to weep and he said, you know, my father was a military officer. I was in the army for a while too. And he was really tough and somewhat abusive. You know, he would push me up against the wall, you know, and uh, hit me. And he said, and the one thing I never gave my father, I would not let him see me cry. And so he said, at one point, he was sitting in the circle and listening to these men tell their stories. And he looked around and tears came into his eyes. And he said, so this is the first time in more than 40 years that I have wept. Just to sit with what's true to let one's heart open and one's body open and one's mind open. We can do that. There's a vulnerability to it, but there's also a tremendous grace and a kind of strength in it because the real vulnerability is not our rigidity. That's where we get in trouble. It's the vulnerability of the bamboo that moves. It's the grasses in the stream. A friend of mine, a woman who did many years of retreat practice, was a psychologist. And uh, she had a terrible background of abuse, sexual abuse in her childhood. And now she does this amazing work. She works with groups of perpetrators. She said it was really frightening for her to do this at first, really scary as you can imagine. But she did it for a year or so, working with groups of men. And she said one day everything turned around for her. She was sitting in this group and hearing these men tell their stories. And of course, as you can imagine, 
all of them from age, you know, 17 to age 70 in that room, they were all abused in some way themselves. And that's how it happens. The transmission of suffering from one generation to another without knowing how to release it. (coughs) She said, and I looked around and I was listening to their stories and all of a sudden I realized I was in a room with boys. And that all these were boys who had been abused just like me. And she said, my heart just cracked in a way I never would have imagined. And I realized that we were all in it together. So underneath all these visualizations and amazing practices and the 50 kinds of Buddhist meditations and mantras and things that the teachings of the elders have, that this tradition has, and Zen has, and Vajrayana. And you look at this wonderful tanka over here of the one of the figures of compassion, one of the figures of uh, the female form of compassion, who has a hundred, uh, excuse me, who has a thousand arms and hands and a thousand eyes, um, and there are all these realms around her and all these beings. And what it comes down to is that she has a thousand eyes to see the sorrows of the world and a thousand hands to extend uh, her compassion to every situation. It's that simple, so simple. To see like that woman did in the circle of these men that she was really in a room full of abused children underneath it all. To see from the heart And it's such a simple practice. From Zen Master Dogen, truth is perfect and complete in itself. It is not something newly discovered. It has always existed. Truth is not far away. It is ever present. It is not something to be attained since not one of your steps ever lead you away from where you are. Do not follow the ideas of others but learn to listen to the voice within your own heart. Your body and mind will become still and you will realize the unity with all things. To actualize the blessedness of meditation, simply sit with pure intention and open heart and determination. Sit in a comfortable way, hold your body erect. In your meditation, you yourself become the mirror reflecting the solution of your problems. The human mind has absolute freedom as its true nature. You can attain this freedom intuitively. Do not work for the freedom, but rather allow the practice and the presence itself to lead you to this liberation. There are thousands upon thousands of students who practice meditation and attained its fruits, do not doubt the possibilities because of the simplicity of the method. If you cannot find the truth right where you are, where else do you, do you expect to find it? Life is short. No one knows what the next moment will bring. Open your heart and mind while you have the opportunity, and thus you will gain the treasure of presence, of wisdom, and compassion, which you can share in abundance with all those you touch. So simple. It's strange, you know, people look for the mystery in special states, or teachers who can levitate, you know, or some phenomenal kind of inner experience like you get taking psychedelics or something, that must be the mystery. I don't know. I mean, every day, a new day appears. It troops out of emptiness, to use Rumi's phrase. The thoughts and the feelings come trooping out of nowhere and say, here I am, feel this, think that, imagine this. And then they disappear and more follow them. I mean, that's pretty weird, right? And there's the sky and then the clouds come by and then they disappear. And we eat, we open this hole at one end of this tube that we move around and stuff dead plants and animals in there, you know, (laughs) 
grind them up with the bones and boop, swallow them with this water inside. Cook the saliva and all of that. Ice cream sundaes. Oh, fresh asparagus. Right. Lamb chops. No. Maybe. Who knows? Oh my God, the poor lamb. Oh, but it tastes so good, right? All this stuff, I mean, it's bizarre being alive. It's really amazing. And you're looking for a miracle, a mystery. It's phenomenal. My friend Roger Walsh, who is a psychiatrist and psychologist and philosopher and has written a lot of different books on spiritual practice and done years of it, once undertook to read the entire encyclopedia of world religion in order to understand spiritual life better. A little little bit of a brain, poor Roger. But anyway... Um, And so I asked him, what did he get from it in the end? And he said, after he had read through all those volumes from Ahura Mazda to Zoroastrianism, right, and everything in between, and saw that there were hundreds of world religions of Taoism and Confucianism and ancient Sumerian teachings and the Aztecs and the Mayans and on and on, you know, the... um, Uh, various African traditions. He said each one had millions of followers. Each one had a creation story and a story of good and evil and of humans' place in the world. And when you read one story after another after another, you realize that what they are is stories. And that they're stories that the human mind lays on top of this great mystery. They're kind of the the story through which one was invited to be in the presence of the mystery of life. (coughs) The word Buddha means one who is awake. And to awaken doesn't mean one solves the mystery. The mystery isn't some problem that you solve and get the right answer to. The mystery is an experience in this moment of life. So Buddha, I am awake. The word Buddha is really your own true nature, this possibility. And in awakening, we awaken to freedom. We awaken to love, mindfulness and compassion. That's really all there is. As Zen master Nyogen Senzaki said, do not put false heads above your own. That means you know, carrying everybody else's ideas instead of yours. Then moment after moment, watch your steps closely. That is all there is to Zen. No new ideas. Be with the suchness of things and be in their presence. So it's not about self-improvement. Oh, I've been coming to Spirit Rock for six months and I'm not improved from when I started. (laughs) You know, I mean, you might want to try self-improvement. You'd do better at the gym, I think, than here, (laughs) you know. The idea is not about changing oneself, but really about awakening. It's very simple, but not so easy, because we forget. Suzuki Roshi speaks about it. He says, after you've practiced for a while, you realize that it's not possible to make rapid, extraordinary progress. Even though you try hard, the progress you make is little by little. It's not like going out in a shower in which you know you're getting wet. In the fog, you do not know you're getting wet, but as you keep walking, you get wet little by little. If your mind has ideas of progress, you may say, oh, this pace is terrible. I keep getting lost, but actually it's not. For when you get wet in a fog, it is difficult to dry yourself. So there's no need to worry about progress. You cannot do it all of a sudden. But by repeating it over and over, by being present over and over, you master the way of freedom. In fact, it's best to say we do not even expect to make progress. Just to be sincere and present in each moment is enough. 
that simple. And you know, there's a, a grace, a directness, a simplicity when one is with great teachers. Remember, my teacher Ajahn Chah used to say, when you do good, the results are good. So simple. If you want love, love. Love the world. So simple. Somebody asked a teacher, is there anything I can do to make myself enlightened? The teacher replied, as little as you can do to make the sun return. Then what's the use of all this hard spiritual practice in meditation? The teacher answered, to make sure you're not asleep when the sun rises. <laughs> it's not what one says, but really what's in the heart. Chuang Su said that a dog is not a good dog because he's a good barker, nor is a teacher a good teacher by what they say, right? It's really what's there and how deeply we're able to listen how much we're able to take our, the gift of our own life in our own way and bring it alive. I am an artist. When my second border, daughter was born, after a difficult labor, we had to have an emergency cesarean operation. We were quite worried I was there at the hospital. I remember talking with the doctor about what I did for a living. The doctor confided in me, said, I wish I'd been a musician because I love to play concert piano. Later, after my wife had the delivery, the doctor came out with the good news that my wife was fine and I had a healthy, brand new baby girl. While we were standing there and I was receiving the good news, another doctor walked up to this physician who had just completed the cesarean surgery, delivered the child and said, excuse me, doctor, I just want to tell you that you performed brilliantly in there and it was an honor to assist you. I turned to the doctor and said, now tell the truth. You've just brought a new life into the world and saved another life and you've had one of your colleagues tell you it's an honor to be in your presence. For heaven's sake, can you honestly say you wish you'd been a musician? The doctor grinned and nodded his head and said, it went pretty well in there. We both laughed and then the doctor said, and I know exactly why, too, because this morning I got up early and for an hour I played Chopin at the piano. (laughs) It's really an honor to live with the sensitivity that is your birthright. It's a responsibility and it's difficult because it makes us vulnerable when we feel things. And we see things that need to be tended to. And we need to respond if our heart is open. But we can do it. It, The capacity of the heart is vast enough to hold the whole wide world. And the invitation of spiritual practice is to trust that, to know that we can live in that simple reality and love and be present. And from that, find our freedom. So I end with a little poem from Zen Master Ryo Khan. My life may appear melancholy, but traveling through this world, I've entrusted myself to heaven. In my sack, three quarts of rice. By the hearth, a bundle of firewood. If someone asks what is the mark of enlightenment or illusion, I cannot say. Wealth and honor are nothing but dust. And as the evening rain falls, I sit in my hermitage and stretch out both feet in answer. Just sit down, just to be. The fact is that once you start spiritual practice, you can't go back. Unfortunately, it's too late. I mean, what are you going to do? Start cultivating more greed and hatred and delusion? You really don't want to do it. So it's happening. You might as well get with the program. Let's sit for a moment.
and a question for you to reflect on as you sit. If you were true to your highest understanding, true to your heart's deepest values, what would that ask of you at this time in your life? If you let yourself look clearly, you can let yourself know. And if you were to be truly free in some difficult area in your life, what would be asked of you to truly free yourself? You can know that as well. Whatever you see in these reflections, make sure to receive them with a heart of compassion and kindness. the chant for tonight. Mm. Let's chant um, Om Mani Padme Hum. Om is the universal sound. Mani Padme means the jewel is in the lotus. The jewel of the mind rests in the lotus of the heart. So what we understand rests, our clear seeing rests in the heart of compassion. And Hum is kind of an exclamation point. So be it. So we'll chant that. It's really a mantra of compassion for a little bit and then go out into the night. Om Mani Padme Hum Om Mani Padme filled with blessings, your heart be open and your life simple. Thank you.